Um, so welcome everybody in the room and online and I'd like to start by acknowledging the Ngambri and Ngunnawal people who are the traditional owners of the land on which ANU is situated that we live and work on. Um, and so today's synapse um, seminar is a little bit different from some of our others. Um, so this is looking at the um, ANU field school uh, with Ben Shaw in the room and then Stuart Bedford is online Zooming from New Zealand. So thanks very much. Awesome, thanks, Ben. Uh, and thanks everyone. So yeah, what, what Stuart and I want to do over the next uh, hour or so is just talk about some of the cultural heritage field schools that uh, ANU and CHL has to offer coming up over the, the next few months in 2024. Uh, particularly in Australia, Vanuatu and Papua New Guinea. And the idea of these field schools is very much to give students uh, experiences not only in archaeological field schools, but to, to broaden the horizons of what uh, cultural heritage and, and how we can do cultural heritage in different parts of the world with local communities, combining a range of different disciplines to address questions about the human past. So, um, I'll open just with a, an introduction about um, some aspects of the field schools, which I think are particularly important. Do a bit of a run through of the one that's running annually in, in Australia. I'll pass it across to Stuart to talk about Vanuatu, uh, and then I'll come back and talk about uh, Papua New Guinea. Um, and of course, these field schools um, have quite a range of unique offerings at ANU um, that give these range of experiences. Yeah, come on in. Uh, and it's run through particularly um, the PNG and Australian ones set up uh, with the Evolution of Cultural Diversity Initiative, uh, particularly looking at uh, creating these sort of diverse uh, cultural experiences and, and looking at the past with all these different disciplines combined. So, as I said, hopefully that, uh, let's see if I can get rid of that. There we go. Um, so, for a long time, the Vanuatu Field School has been operating uh, very successfully um, and as a flagship of CHL under Stuart. And so in expanding these field school programs, we wanted to set up ones that were complementary to what's been run in Vanuatu, but offer sort of very unique experiences so they don't overlap entirely and give students a range of unique experiences. So in 2022, I set up one in Papua New Guinea and Victoria. Uh, 23, Shimona set one up in Indonesia, and this year one starting up in Spain on a Neanderthal site with uh, Sophia. Um, today we'll just be talking about, oh, there we go, the three here, but I do encourage you to talk to the conveners if you're interested in uh, any of the field schools that are running. And down in Victoria, I'm particularly uh, thankful that Kate Freeman has been helping to run this field school, as well as Rob Henderson uh, over a couple of years. So um, it's really sort of getting up and running. So before I launch into uh, each of the field schools individually, I kind of just want to talk about you know, why field school, how do they contribute to our curriculum uh, and our degree programs in our uh, various teachings of, of archaeology and sort of area studies. So it's more than just digging a hole. I mean, when you think of archaeology, it's, it's the excavation part of things. And of course, you know, digging a nice square hole is, is quite pleasing, but there's more to it than that. And we sort of want to bring in sort of the both tangible and intangible aspects of, of cultural history with this. Now, within this whole, there's about 8,000 years of, of history in it, um, but it's connecting those dots across all the disciplines that, that make it um, uh, important and, and bring those connections into place. And one of the key things that they do is, is really connect those classroom teachings with real, real world applied scenarios. So think of an archeology span of either analytical skills, uh, whether it's the theoretical underpinnings that uh, contribute to all, all archaeological work uh, and not just archaeological across linguistic and, and uh, genetic work as well, uh, and combining it with area studies. So whether you're working in the Pacific or the Asian uh, areas, so Pacific and Asia, which is a specialty of this school, uh, bring in those intangible aspects, the cultural values that the communities that you'd be working with value and how to connect um, past uh, in a way that's meaningful to the communities that you're working with, but also to the um, the sort of the, the broader communities. We're looking at the past that's interesting, but we're to make it relevant to a, a broader context. And of course, we're doing this anywhere in the world that we are working is working ethically on country with traditional landowners. 
um, and the conveners of all the field schools uh, around the Asia Pacific region have built up long term connections with the communities that they're working with. So the students on these field schools get first hand uh, experience of, of how that sort of process looks like. And of course, it is a very much an ongoing process of, of working on traditional lands um, owned by, by the communities that you're working there with. And of course, particularly with archaeology, but also with uh, linguistics and genetic studies, you're, you're looking at fragments and, and to try and bring those fragments into the, the limelight and make sense of them and to turn them into sort of comprehensive uh, and understandable narratives about the past requires interpretation and a long um, process, beginning with uh, excavation of getting these things out of the ground. So um, bringing the students along on that process of, of finding, say, these little fragments of, of what looks like nothing were actually quite exciting in terms of what they can reveal about the past um, and connecting it with, um, say, oral traditions, um, say, down here in, in Finglewood in the Mornington Peninsula area, um, about what, what that cultural material might actually mean. Uh, another key aspect of the field school, of course, is working as a team, both as a team and individually, but certainly what really comes out in say like looking at the notebooks of the students and all of the uh, assessments is that everyone's looking at the archaeology from a different perspective, either from their own sort of um, through their own lens and what makes, you know, even a research project so exciting and uh, productive is when you have many minds sort of coming together to look at things from, a, from different angles. We're really trying to bring that together on a field school to demonstrate that and it comes out quite nicely. And as we go through getting students to think critically about what they're actually seeing in the ground, that there's not just one interpretation of what that might be, but many, and how you sort of build up uh, frameworks around that to, to support uh, those narratives or hypothesis testing, whether that's just recording uh, sections in the ground, which then translate into archaeological information. This is a good example in the PNG field school where some divers found a clay pot while they're out spearfishing. And then we're trying to um, think through how that might have got there in terms of the context of the pot, cultural connections, where it was and, and why it might have been there. And then out at uh, the Mornington Peninsula, talking with the cultural heritage officers from Bunurong and, and about some of the stone tools we're finding about how they might have been used um, three, four thousand years ago by the people who made them. And of course, it allows students to explore interests and make connections. Um, in the field while you're sort of engaging with the different aspects of the field school. So people come in uh, with with ideas about what interests them about a field school, but you know, might walk away with uh, a, a passion about field heritage or paleoecology or a certain type of technology that they want to pursue in their latest studies or take that with them beyond their university sort of studies into the professional realm. Um, and of course, Encouraging students uh, either within the field school programs or, or afterwards as supervised research projects to take on an element of the project that you're working on uh, to develop it a little bit further in terms of a, um, a specific research project. And this can be done at both an undergraduate or postgraduate level. The idea of this is to try and um, really get students honing in on that research process of how that's done and working through some information that they've created themselves, um, getting them ready to go into postgraduate studies or into their post-university careers um, and take that with them wherever they like to go. And that's a very rewarding aspect actually is to see postgraduate students where they go after uh, they leave university. We can't discount of course personal growth in these, these environments and, and our job as conveners and running these field schools is really to create these supportive environments for the students so that they can actually explore and, and grow. Um, again, a very rewarding part of, of these field schools, particularly those overseas that might take students outside of their comfort zone. Um, designed to be challenging, but a very supportive sort of uh, place to be. And of course, like anything, right, you bring in your own personal experiences to, to field schools. And um, for me, uh, studying at Otago and Dunedin, we had our field school on the West Coast the South Island of New Zealand. And that was a very profound learning experience for myself and the cohort that I went through. Uh, so working with the research directors, which here is Richard Bolter uh, and the late Chris Jackham, you know, working on an early Māori site uh, with the communities and sort of working through what is some pretty phenomenal archaeology. 
but you know a lot of this cohort you know are still keeping contact today so i mean you really build uh, connections that you know uh, transcend the university space that you're working in so that's what a build school is in my mind uh, and, and certainly is uh, seen across all the build tools that we see but the foundations of a field school a few things about what um each one really i think has in common that, that that we build up from to build up these unique programs. This is a really nice photo from Fingal Reserve on the Monica Peninsula. Uh, early morning, you know, beautiful landscape. Um, there's the sun coming through in the sand dunes that we're about to, to excavate. Um, I think one important aspect is, is travel. I mean, it's fairly obvious when you're getting on a plane to go to Vanuatu, Indonesia, or Papua New Guinea, or wherever just to logistically get there. Um, but psychologically, there's sort of this aspect to it too, you know, even if getting from, from Canberra to, to Victoria, you're getting outside of your usual environment. And that kind of like, you know, you know, your mind becomes sort of hyper aware, you're in this new environment. So your learning experience is really quite vivid. And I think that's quite an important thing to build into these field schools and to have them in as much as possible sort of like a rural or a semi-rural uh, environment. You, know, you really connect to the landscape in, in different ways. Uh, in Vanuatu PNG, that's very easy. You're out in the village scenario, um, you know, beautiful sort of coastal areas, um, beautiful places to be. But even down in Victoria, um, you're out in the countryside when you're trying to teach uh, like landscape approaches, um, talking with the traditional owners about how people might have engaged with these landscapes. Much easier to see when you're outside of that really dense urban environment. And of course, um, staying together in, in the places really builds a, a cohort as well. So um, either in the lodge or in the village, you know, it's a shared experience, you know, hopefully, hopefully for good. But uh, as I said, they're designed to be a very intensive uh, two or three weeks for the most part. And what we're aiming to do is get the students to come back, you know, tired, but happy. You know, it's, it's a day-to-day -day grind. It's a lot to, to cram in, but it's, it's sort of designed that way to sort of um, be like this vivid experience. So it's not just the archaeology that they're learning, it's the cultural experiences that go with it. Uh, and of course, when you're framing all these new things that are happening all at the same time, it's very tiring. But uh, we're trying to build in time for people to sort of chill out and sort of take stock on what they're doing so they don't burn out. Um, but in the areas that we work, certainly um, uh, the, the places in Vanuatu, um, in Papua New Guinea, in Victoria, Indonesia, you want to have a field site with significant research potential. So the students are part of a, um, a research process that's going to lead to something that has that lasting impact that they can sort of hook into and be a part of. Um, in Papua New Guinea, for example, it's sort of these maritime connections, part of the, the Kuda ring that are sort of uh, chipping into, and of course, earlier evidence as well. Um, and you want to have a team as much as you can on these field schools with a range of expertise and experiences. And the reason for that is to give you know, students a range of perspectives about uh, what cultural heritage is, how it can be done, uh, people's own experiences, uh, to give a broad sort of range of experiences as possible in those scenarios that uh, they're in. Um, of course, logistical flexibility and contingencies is a it is a no-brainer for a field school, and that's just, you know, to get from A to B. Um, things invariably go not to plan, so it's just built in like, okay, if we can't get there, what do we do next? Um, that's obviously for safety, well-being, but also just to, to make things run as smoothly as possible. Um, and we'll talk about this a little bit in a second, but some aspect of being uh, interdisciplinary uh, and increasingly transdisciplinary, at least having multiple disciplines coming at questions that you're looking at from different perspectives. And then ideally uh, over time or where possible to sort of have those disciplines actually informing on the research approach before you get there and actually um, changing the way that you look at the cultural heritage. Um, and of course, as this is part of the uh, Evolution of Cultural Diversity Initiative, this is very much the sort of what, what it's focused on doing. It's, it's bringing those disciplines together um, to approach questions of the human past in various different ways and actually think of, about the way that we even um, come up with research questions and approaches entirely differently 
as if we're thinking about it from, say, archaeology or linguistics on their own. Um, and in the field, you know, that reinforces the relevance of the human past to the present day. You're working with um, traditional communities for the most part um, and future populations, you know, whether that be sort of resilience to sort of climactic um, catastrophes or, or climactic change, which is very much impacting many of the Pacific populations. Um, and then sort of embracing the mess, you know, so archaeology only gets you so far and trying to understand the past, you know, it's based on physical remains for the most part, you know, linguistics can certainly tell you other aspects, so can genetics, so can biology, so um, trying to bring those aspects into it. And so the field schools really go through several stages of development, right, you want to have this conception where you want to incorporate into a field school all those elements that we're talking about, and then picking a place where that might come to um, fruition, uh, demonstrating it, just like getting it up and running, demonstrating that logistically it can be run, uh, economically it can be run, uh, and then develop sort of the, the framework within it, you know, how it's, you know, work out all the kinks to make sure it's running smoothly, and then expanding it by bringing on a, by the other disciplines or other aspects that, um, that work, and then sort of intertwining it so that you, you don't have this sort of linear progress of research design, excavation, interpretation, and synthesis, you know, you're bringing in these other elements into that research design. The excavation, uh, the interpretation phase is more of a long and winding road. You want students to sort of really get a sense of that. Um, and that you don't just have one interpretation, you've got many to create the synthesis and, and through those research projects and, and really engaging with uh, why we do cultural heritage. Um, students are able to see that in, in, in practice uh, and connect that with their sort of classrooms sort or of teaching that they get through all their undergraduate and postgraduate courses. Um, so I'll quickly run through the Mornington Peninsula Cultural Heritage Field School. Um, and I've underlined cultural heritage here because it's, uh, you know, it, it really transcends archaeology, as I said earlier. Uh, and this one in particular is unique in the sense that it's really aimed at connecting students with the professional industry of cultural heritage management. Um, so not just archaeological place, uh, sites, it's places, it's objects. It's the um, tangible and intangible histories of those places with the traditional owners and how that's managed in like, you know, a growing society with development, how you protect uh, or mitigate damage to archaeological sites. And most archaeology students at least go into this industry. And I'd recommend that even if you're going to a research sort of role or, or an academic pathway to at least step into the professional realm for a little while, because it really broadens your sort of horizons about how it's applied in, in a real world sort of scenario. And we're very fortunate here to um, link up with Heritage Insight, which is a well-known cultural heritage in, uh, consultancy in Melbourne. And then through that with the Bunurong Land Council, whose traditional lands include the Mornington Peninsula, like metropolitan Melbourne area. Um, and through that, we're able to sort of bring in all of these elements that I'm not necessarily well tuned in from a Victorian aspect, I worked in cultural heritage management, but in New Zealand, to bring all those elements together for the students to give them like this in-depth uh, sort of experience. And we wanted to keep it as broad as possible. So it's open to both um, undergraduate and postgraduate students. And the key element here is the industry engagement. So we've brought in all the players that are involved in cultural heritage management in Victoria, uh, right from the people who broke the legislation to those who manage it, uh, down to the ones that actually practice it on a day-to-day -day basis. So Heritage Victoria, they look after the primarily the um, European historical heritage. We've got Jeremy Smith, who manages the legislation there. First people state relations, we had Harry Webber come in and talk to the students. He's, he's the architect of, of the Aboriginal uh, legislation. Heritage Insight is the consultancy we work with. We, we have a careers panel with everyone from uh, Bianca, who's the director, all the way down to the graduate archaeologists have just started to sort of get their perspectives on how they got into the role, um, their journey into the industry, what they've learned, what they wish they knew, you know, all those kind of things that you don't necessarily get in a classroom, but you only learn by actually sort of doing it. Um, La Trobe University, we've had uh, Stephen Murray, linguist, come and talk to us, uh, David Frankel, who's, who's done more archaeology in Victoria than probably anybody. Um, 
and try to link that in with sort of like cross institutional um, student enrollments. Of course, vulnerable vulnerable land council talking about sort of tangible cultural values that they hold very dear. That if we're going to be doing archaeology on their country, this is what you know it should look like. Uh, major road projects, you know, if you're building highways and roads, of course, you'll come across cultural heritage. How's that managed? Parks Victoria, which we partner with, who manages massive areas of land in Victoria. Um, and of course, down to the local councils and of course, ANU as well. Just getting all these perspectives. So you're, you're seeing it from, you know, many different um, viewpoints. In fact, like one of the favourite talks um, of the students was by Ecclesi Nick Evans, who came down and gave a talk about linguistics and how we connect that to the past, which is, is fantastic. Um, so this is what where it is. It's down here at Cape Shank, right at the very southern tip of Mornington Peninsula. Melbourne's up the top here. We stay at Point Leo. Postcodes are at the top um, that you're rolling for undergraduate and postgraduate. The key thing is here that there's two sites that we work on simultaneously. So the students over a two-week period uh, run February annually. There's one week on the historical site, one on the uh, primarily Aboriginal uh, June site. Uh, and that's by design because we want to sort of show different con um, context ways of dealing with different archaeological contexts. Um, and importantly, these areas were specifically chosen by Bunnerol for investigation. Bulls and Airport. Um, we went to Bunnerol and said, you know, first of all, would you like to partner with us? Where would you like us to go? What's an area that needs investigation? And they said, yeah, we want Cape Shank and, and Bingle because they are very significant cultural landscapes in our country. Um, we want to understand more about them, so it's a privilege to be there. Uh, and we've done this over three field seasons now. And as that model before about sort of expanding it this year, we introduced a paleo environmental field site out here on French Island, which is just a wickedly nice place to go and visit. Really, really cool. Just completely different to, to anywhere else. Um, but you're working under legislated framework too. So these pieces of legislation really guide what you can and can't do um, in that cultural heritage space. And you'll deal with legislation anywhere in the world that you do this work. So it's important to understand the mechanisms of that. And you get up close and personal with these legislation, with the talkers, uh, speakers that we have. Um, I swear that most of the great years that I have now from the start of this field school, when it started during COVID, because it was going down to scope out this location between like border closures, lockdowns, I mean, Melbourne got hit hard, but not us, not so bad, but man, it just coming and going uh, as you went. So we, we went down and looked at a few places. Uh, the peninsula is great because it enables us to maintain a bubble, which was part of the location in the first place. Got the go ahead, but you know, we had to postpone it at the end of 21 because of this peak in COVID cases, which we postponed it to February 22. End of the year, we were like, okay, guys, we'll see you next year. We'll kick off in February. Things were going upwards. So everyone was just going, hang on a minute. You know, we can do it, but should we? You know, and everyone wanted to sort of uh, pull the pin. And at the time, the only thing that would have saved it was these things were rapid and rapid antigen tests, which had just come out. I didn't know about them, but uh, it was the only thing that was going to save the day, you know, to get it going. So I said, yeah, of course, yeah, I'll, get, I'll get 100 tests, you know. We can test everybody, it'll be safe. Got up on the phone, I said, bloody hell, where am I going to get one, let alone 100? But through a supplier, I got 100. The Australian government then took them off uh, the supply for the education sector. But fortunately, they had their own little supply, gave them to us, and at the literally the leave of the hour, we are able to sort of run the, the build school, and it quite got us going that we could sort of build on it each year. But man, great years. Um, was a long and winding road, but because of that, we scoped out a few different locations, which are just superb for a field school. You know, tick all those boxes we talked about. So, uh, that to say, in future years, if it's not down in Mornington, which we will continue to run it there uh, for as long as Bunnerong will have us, but elsewhere in Bunnerong country, elsewhere in Victoria, you've got these beautiful landscapes with built heritage, you know, Shearer's quarters where you can stay. Um, so, anywhere it's going to have all of those aspects that are very key. Uh, to a field school. Um, we've had 55 students going through the um, field school so far uh, over the three years. We'll, of course, be running it again next year. 
um, really great. All years have been fantastic. The students are wonderful, really engaging. Um, I learn a lot from the students as well as, as the other way around, so it's really fantastic. Um, one of the great things I'm, I'm grateful for ANU and CHL and ICTI for supporting is that we've now put eight of the Bunurong Heritage Offices through the course with ANU scholarships. So they've got accreditation for those courses. Um, and the, the benefits for that is that they've taken it to the other reps already um, applying some of the methodologies that they've learned on the field school, you know, scaling it up and down depending on where they are working and what kind of scenarios they're in. Uh, and two of them are now starting the bachelor's degrees at La Trobe next year, which is fantastic. Um, so yeah, a range of students coming in, mainly from archaeology and undergraduate, but uh, open to a range of different um, uh, disciplines because it connects in, in different ways. Just quickly, before I wrap this up, there's the two sites that we're working on. There's the Cape Shank Lighthouse Reserve under the um, guidance of Wendy Dolling and Dave Brody, a phenomenal historic archaeologist at Heritage and Site, um, taking the students through the nuances of historic archaeology, working like a really beautiful, would have been a very remote location back in the 19th century when most of these buildings were, were erected. Um, and looking at, you know, the European life ways of what would have been the lighthouse keeper and their families. Um, and of course, cross cultural interactions with Aboriginal populations that would have lived in there, lived there in the area. Um, so mid 19th century, we're applying sort of single context recording here, very different to how we would approach the archaeology in the sand dunes. So the students are really uh, understanding not only how we record archaeology, but why. We sort of encourage them to to question why we do things and if we can't come up with a good answer then we maybe we shouldn't do it because there's no logic behind it so everything has a logic uh beginning from excavation through to generating that information through to recording and uh students are there along for the ride so this is just an aerial photo with a historic plan i think from 1890s superimposed you can see some buildings still standing we excavated initially behind the old head keeper's quarters. Great range of uh, material objects, you know, all the remains from what they've been eating, dumping out the back. So talking about domestic use. But the real red one was the stables, uh, demolished at some point in the early 20th century, but the structural remains are very much there. They're very rich material record as well, um, tracing that evidence over various iterations of expansion of these buildings. Um, as you can see here, from 22 to 23, 24. Um, and now uh, Heritage Victoria have come in with Parks Victoria want to open up the whole area so Parks Victoria can preserve it uh, as a permanent feature of the sort of public engagement of this area. Um, and you can start to see the sort of makeup of this former building with the walls and the stable area. This is a wall that's been pushed over. And of course, various remains that come out that relate to sort of the domestic use of these spaces. Um, this year, we're able to expand the program a bit and have an open day with Parks Victoria and Heritage Victoria. They came in with uh, remains of shipwrecks that have crashed around the Cape Shank area, and it gave the students uh, an opportunity to actually engage with the public and translate what they're actually doing in the field to those narratives about, you know, translating to, to a public in a, in a very succinct and engaging way. Um, very successful, I think, by the end of the day, um, the team there had over 200 people come through doing tours, which is really cool. So we'll do that again next year. Uh, Cape Shank, the sand dunes. So this is the other site that we we'll work at here. Again, applied skill sets, but the students are in the driving seat here. So the discussions that we have that guide what we do next and why we do it uh, with the students. So if we've dug like a little spade hole here found something okay what do we do next we want to find out what's happening with this fresh water body or what's happening up on the dune uh, part of that so guide the excavation so it's really quite a fun process and a, a real focus on connecting the cultural evidence with the natural environment so uh, looking at the sediment the soil development how that interacts with cultural heritage uh, past, past vegetation would have looked like how the sand dune would have formed and uh, vice versa and that's all reflected in the assessment. So field notebook, recording what they do day to day, recording portfolios, recording forms, drawings, summary report for uh, postgraduates, which would be expected of any sort of uh, consultancy or, or research excavation. And then a 
Park Victoria style interpretive panel, um, which they've given us the templates for that would be used in sort of their parks. I can't really go into the results of this yet, um, only because it's just a condition with Bunurong that we talk about this with Bunurong community first. But needless to say, um, very significant results in terms of connecting this landscape to the broader country and looking, looking at sort of vertical, temporal, and uh, between the excavations that it's those spatial patternings of what's happening across that landscape. And looking at these different sort of uh, formation processes across this sort of dune landscape of how people have used it, which has been quite an effective way of getting the students to think about what's happening across uh, this really quite small but complex environment and using things like the total station and the W level to do mapping and so forth. Um, but really what this tells us so far, the results is that it tells us how people have used this landscape over the last 8,000 years since the peninsula became the peninsula. Um, and the significance of this place is that it was once part of a land bridge connecting Tasmania with uh, Southern Victoria. And so translating that to how people were using it as it became a peninsula, as the sea levels came up, as those dunes changed and how people were interacting uh, over that time. And of course, the trip out to French Island um, with Simon Haley and Simon Connor, just truly remarkable place to be, uh, and they'll continue to build that program up. So I will leave it there for now. And uh, Stuart, I'm going to turn it over to you to um, talk about Vanuatu. Yeah, okay. Uh, ben, thanks so much for that. You're beautifully organised and uh, with a great presentation. I don't have any particular slides, but uh, and uh, hi to everyone in the, in the, at the seminar. Um, I'd just like to, you know, emphasise what Ben has said about the broad nature of these uh, these field schools, not just simply the archaeology, but the archaeology uh, right through to the sort of travel experience, uh, the food experience, or, or whatever uh, other aspects of of the field school, living together twenty four seven, uh, team building. All that sort of thing, and I think very much these field schools for the discipline of archaeology are really the you know, sort of the strength and the core of archaeology uh, at the ANU. In 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 I think in many respects, the numbers of field schools that uh, various researchers have been able to initiate, um, often associated with um, Australian Research Council. Uh, grants, so there's very specific projects that um, um, have. Um, you were doing the visuals there, Ben. Is it? Oh no, are you having a look at the clip? Yeah, I've got the video here. I can pause it if you want. Yeah, no, please pause it here yeah, because we'll we'll have the music. Uh, we'll have the talking. The, you know, the students actually talk about the experiences. So it's. Um, but um, yeah, anyway, uh, as those that have been around for a bit longer at the ANU, you, you will know that uh, you know CAS also had a wonderful field school program that CHL, uh, uh, you know, also we both contributed to this the wonderful program that that students were able to go to different parts of the world and experience and become involved in completely different projects, uh, you know, Britain, Germany, Ireland, Southeast Asia. Uh, and the Pacific, uh, and and through the hard work, uh, primarily of Phil Piper, we even we even got a vice chancellor's award for uh, teaching in the field. Um, I think that was two thousand and eighteen. I can't really recall what year it was, but uh, as all of you also know, been around for a few years. Getting awards from the vice chancellor doesn't mean that. Uh, your programs will be continue to be funded. In fact, the CAS programs lost considerable funding the year after. So it's great to see the uh, these fieldwork programs again, uh, really coming into the mix, uh, and particularly, of course, after COVID. Um, the the Vanuatu Field School has been running uh, pretty much since two thousand and ten. I think the last season at the Tayuma site, the famed Lapita burial site, two thousand and ten. It was set up and associated with the Masters of Archaeological Science uh, originally, so it was uh, graduate students. 
and uh, we um, have uh, run field schools, as I say, most of our field schools in Vanuatu have been associated with uh, uh, ARC funded uh, projects in different parts of the archipelago. So we've, we've had one, one on Santo, Santo Island in the north, and then we got uh, funding for a southern Vanuatu project. And um, uh, Ben mentioned the, the the experiences of the logistical aspects of the field school being a an experience, certainly an experience for the students, but of course, running them, you're you're actually stressing at quite high levels sometimes regarding logistics. But um, so we ran them for several years on a Niwa Island, a small Polynesian speaking island uh, in southern Vanuatu. Uh, and doing, then also for three years on a nightium, the, the southernmost uh, inhabited island of the arch archipelago. And that was very much a multidisciplinary uh, field school. In that time, Matt Preble was actually coordinating them. So we had the paleo uh, ecology in the big swamp behind uh, the, the village of Inalguet in southern, uh, on a on southern nightium. Uh, we managed to find an early colonizing site, the Peter site there. So we had really uh, 3,000 years of occupation right through to the wonderful missionary complex, extraordinary missionary complex, uh, the first really a substantial European-run mission station 18, uh, dating to 1848. Uh, much of the building still standing to roof height. So it, it had this wonderful uh, range of specialities, primarily in archaeology. Uh, but also Frederick Valentin, who's been a, a really uh, colleague from uh, from uh, CNRS in, in Paris. She's been a major uh, contributor to the field schools uh, with her uh, focus on uh, burial uh, archaeology uh, and ritual. Uh, so she's been on the field schools every year since, uh, since they started. And as I say, a really a fabulous colleague and a fabulous instructor in the field, very strict, but uh, the students uh, take to that and, and learn uh, learn hugely off her in terms of, of uh, uh, the archaeology that she uh, manages. Um, the One of the aspects also, I think that is a plus, uh, Ben's talked about the cultural heritage aspects, and of course Vanuatu, it's very different, for example, uh, to Victoria or Australia generally, Cultural heritage really is managed by local communities uh, rather than government institutions and uh, run, run, you know, they're integrated into the community's lifeways, really, and their, and their sort of um, stories of, of the landscape and everything. So, but one of the, uh, one of the few cultural, uh, UNESCO inscribed sites, uh, areas, uh, cultural sites in, in the Pacific is the Roy Mata uh, domain and Chris Ballard, anyone wants the further information on, on the Roy Mata domain, Chris Ballard, who with his uh, part, uh, wife, uh, Meredith Wilson, pretty much in the local communities got this uh, registered in 2008, a fabulous site. So that kicks off the initial field school. So people land in, in Port Vila, relatively short flight, um, and we take it slowly. We have the wonderful day tour to Roy Mata, but also we visit the Vanuatu Cultural Centre and Museum. And um, I think having worked in Vanuatu myself for now uh, almost 30 years, uh, you get this, you know, build up this wonderful network of, of people in the communities uh, and, 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 and staff at the Cultural Centre so who are very much engaged in the field schools and very enthusiastic about them. Um, and so the, the people at the Vanuatu Cultural Centre are our primary collaborators in, in Vanuatu. There's no, uh, the University of South Pacific doesn't teach archaeology. They have some history, undergraduate history. Um, hopefully, we'll be looking at some collaborations with the new, new University of Vanuatu. Again, they don't have specifically archaeology in their programmes, but uh, certainly... Um, they're running the social sciences program, so we may uh, involve some of their students in future excavations. But um, so I think one of the things that's really uh, fascinated me about Vanuatu and 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 
myself personally getting to know that you know the three thousand year history and the in the contemporary society uh, so well is how little Australasians actually uh, understand or are aware of the Melanesian region. I mean, there was the fabulous uh, description by one of our one of the Australian prime ministers describing the Melanesian region as an arc of instability. And of course, there's this sort of uh, historical historical uh, tropes about it being a cannibal, you know, sort of cannibals and all sorts of other things. Um, so very much uh, uh, has this reputation of being sort of uh, hard to understand um, and, and dangerous, uh, where in fact, <laughs> as, as those that have had any experience with most of those places, uh, sure, there's areas where you don't want to visit, uh, you don't, and you steer clear of, like like uh, like Canberra on a Friday night. Um, but um, one of the more satisfying things for me has been seeing the students who have never been to that part of the world really uh, embrace it. And and uh, um, yeah, I mean the archaeology is an important component for those students that are specifically studying archaeology. But, um, you know, funnily enough, it took me years to realise that the one, you know, the, the, the students actually, if the archaeology is great, they're great. They're really wrapped about it. Um, and as I say, if you're talking about Pacific archaeology, if you're if you're talking about Lapita, you know, first colonisation of remote Oceania, you can talk about that in the lecture theatre for, you know, an hour, two hours a week for several weeks. And, you know, most people sort of, drift off, doze off, but in the field and people dealing with those objects, you can see a total immediate connection and um, enthusiasm. And, and as, a, as uh, many of the students that have gone to Vanuatu have continued in Pacific archaeology and many, uh, quite a number have gone on to do, uh, not only because of the Vanuatu but field school, but other field schools at the ANU have gone on to do PhDs. So, uh, as I say, I think it's really one of the strengths of the ANU. And for me, uh, it's really a core uh, of archaeology to, to, for, for students to get out there um, with trowel in hand uh, in these various situations. Um, so I don't think I've got much more to say. I, I, uh, the, the earlier, earlier field schools, were in, I have to say, quite logistically challenging uh, regions. Um, and the one in 2002, after COVID, of course, we um, were all a bit, felt strange traveling, but um, we uh, we traveled by, half the party traveled by boat to the small island and half the party traveled by plane, but were delayed because of bad weather. So I've uh, decided that future field schools for my own um, my own sense of uh, um, peace of mind is that uh, we'll be on a farte, but we have found a truly, truly fabulous uh, site or region on 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 a farte island. So a farte is the is the central island, the capital, Port Vila, and students fly into the capital, and there's no further flying anywhere, which has has been a major relief. Um, the uh, the site at Pang Pang, which uh, we ran field school, the first field school at Pang Pang, and the first investigation there last year in July. Um, all of these areas are different, you know. The the, the archipelago of Vanuatu is 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 is, is uh, really defined by its diversity in languages and and, and customs and uh, traditions and things. So you're never quite sure you rock up in, in different villages. You're never quite sure what the reception is going to be. Um, but uh, it turned out that Pang Pang, I think, is probably yeah, one of the more supportive and, and enthusiastic areas that I've worked in. Um, Lapita was found there. That's, you know, the colonizing, uh, potter, the pottery associated with the colonizing settlers 3,000 years ago. Beautifully preserved site. Uh, extinct fauna, you know, more than 250 tortoise bones found in, in a very small area of excavation. So a really fabulous site in terms of the research aspect, 
fabulous in terms of students uh, being able to be involved in such a wonderful archaeology. Of course, it's all downhill from that afterwards. So it's, it's difficult to explain that to students when they're excavating a colonizing the Peter site that uh, that you know this is not how it's you know on their first excavation this is not really how archaeology works uh, all the time but um, but also it's a site it's a, it's an area that uh, we have the early earliest colonizing site and near the sea but right the whole valley system uh, has archaeology right across it and um, it um, you know right up to the historic period where we have recorded with the local community 21 abandoned villages uh, that's associated with introduced diseases in the 19th century. The village now is down near the coast, a single village, uh, which was associated with missionary teachers uh, establishing a village down on the coast. So you've got this incredible uh, range of sites um, and uh, and potential research uh, interests of, of the various students. So, um, so I think, uh, yeah, I'll leave it there. I've, I've uh, been recommended that I, as I hadn't organized anything, we would, uh, one of the short clips about the Tongoa field, uh, field school, that was 2022. Um, also something that uh, I hadn't really uh, promoted before, but um, realize that these field schools are also very attractive for students who are simply interested in Melanesia or Vanuatu uh, and maybe majoring in other disciplines, but uh, would you know like to to come along. So on this particular one, we had a law student, uh, we had an economic student, we had a ling linguistic student, and the rest of the archaeologists. So I think it's a great little, blurb from them it's primarily um it was put together by the uh, vanuatu cultural center uh, film and sound sound uh, unit you can see here uh, again it's associated with this massive uh, volcanic eruption that split one of the islands in in central vanuatu 550 years ago and we had uh that was a very uh, wonderfully multi multidisciplinary field school uh, Chris Ballard there running the sort of program anthropological historical old tradition uh, program with the communities which some students got involved with we had the vol a volcanology student from Auckland we had of course as I mentioned the, the, the famed Frederick Valentin working on burials uh, in one area also a student uh, or, uh, on um, focusing on uh, on identifying charcoal in the archaeological record and he was roaring around collecting all species and and um and, and then um, turning them into charcoal so we had this wonderfully uh diverse group of people um that made the the, the field school very enriching and in the, the community there also were, were just were just fabulous in terms of welcoming and supportive so i think i'll leave it there ben if you can do the technical stuff and kick kick off. It's a ten minute clip, but I think it gets a it gives a really good feel of how, what the students uh, experienced. Here we are on the southeast coast of Congo Island, a very very dramatic landscape in many respects, as it relates to uh, a massive volcanic eruption five hundred fifty years ago, Kuai Kuai eruption. Kuai was the island, the name of the island before the eruption, as it once encompassed both the islands of Tonga and Epi in the far north. Tonga is about 45 from the square, Epi 450. So the island of Kuai would have been uh, the fifth largest island in Vanuatu, but it split uh, with the massive eruption. So the project that this short clip relates to is the Kuai project. It's an ARC funded project that is looking or focusing on the eruption, but also the broader 3000 year history, human history of the island. We've got a whole range of specialists, archeologists, historians, linguists, volcanologists, um, and also particularly, and most important, and what has brought people here for generations is the old traditions and the local community's knowledge about this extraordinary event. We have a field school at the moment from the ANU, uh, a whole bunch of students 
again, various risk religions, and various interests, who uh, will we'll see if we can get someone to talk about their experiences on the island. So it's an archaeological field school primarily, but also run with Chris Fowler, the historian, and the volcanologist uh, Shane Cronin from Auckland. G'day, I'm Brad. Uh, I'm one of the uh, students here uh, as part of the Cool Wave project from the Australian National University. Uh, I'm Jess. Uh, I'm also from ANU. Uh, I study a mix of Indigenous studies, anthropology and archaeology. Uh, and because of that, this seemed like a wonderful opportunity to come out here and get to put uh, some of those skills that I've been learning at university uh, to practice in the field uh, and pick up some of the skills that's really hard to learn in a classroom. So, you know, things around excavation, uh, spending time with uh, Chris when he's been out uh, doing some work setting up for some oral history research next year. I'm an, uh, I'm an anthropology student that's uh, leaning more towards archaeology every day, it seems. Um, my focus here has been on, on the excavation. Um, so at the moment, uh, we're working on this mission house here. Uh, just just up from uh, Arrow Village, um, and it's been it's uh, yeah it's a, it's a phenomenal site really. There's uh, there's so much so much history here. There's so much to, to sort of get into. The house has been uh, knocked down by hurricanes and rebuilt, and it's there's there's so much uh, there's there's so much here to uh, sort of get out get out into. It's, it's, it's been really great. Um, I found it really interesting to be. Uh, living in a village in Vanuatu. I spent a bit of time living in remote communities in Australia, and there's some elements that are the same. There's dogs everywhere, uh, and then some areas that are really different and been really interesting. So trying new kinds of food, um, uh, listen to the string band at night, uh, and getting to uh, have those conversations uh, in downtime with uh, local villagers or uh, uh, some of the people we've been working with. Um, I know some of the students have been talking with the kids, trying to learn more language uh, while playing, you know, a game of cat. Um, and it's been really valuable to be living uh, on site uh, and be able to talk to people who know the land and the country so well. Being in in the community is it really gives you a bit of a, a sense of um, place and the location. And for example, we um, we were digging excavating. Uh, Past uh, the other week, we were excavated. We were digging down under, underneath the Kuai Ash. We found um, a whole layer of cultural material, including the hearts and ground up and things, um, and stones for cooking lap lap. And we've been eating lap lap here as well. And it's so it's so cool to see like the, the continuation of of the history of the history there. And you don't get that unless you actually integrated into uh, into the community here. So it's been a really unique uh, unique experience in that way. So I'm an undergrad at ANU, Australian National University. Um, I don't study much archaeology, but I've done a little bit, and this seems like a great opportunity to come out and try my hand at something that I haven't really done before in a beautiful environment. Uh, yeah, and I'm um, I'm a master's student, um, so this is not my first rodeo with archaeology. <laughs> um, I did my undergraduate uh, focusing on Mediterranean cultures um, at Macquarie University in Sydney, um, and then I've switched to ANU to do my master's in um, archaeological and evolutionary science, um, specializing in bioarchaeology and forensic anthropology. Um, so working with human remains and burials and that kind of stuff. Um, and I wasn't sure if that was actually going to happen while we were here, but um, we have had the chance to work on some human remains, which has been really interesting. Um, but this is my first field school that I've ever done um, because of COVID, everything kind of messed up with that. Um, so it's been great to actually go somewhere and be taught how to do. And I'm a linguistics major, and so I'm really interested in the languages. And the languages of Vanuatu are so interesting. You've got Islamo, which is spoken basically everywhere, but every every place has its own language, and it's great to try that into the archaeology and the languages over the time. And in the, yeah. the cultural landscape of Vanuatu has been a lot more than what I expected because I knew nothing about Pacific countries. Um, but it has been a truly rewarding experience. And I'm 
very well done. Yeah, we we'll definitely recommend it to anybody. It's gorgeous. It's a bit hot, but it's it's worth it. Um, I'm Jessica. My degree is with the Bachelor of Archaeology and Practice from Edinburgh. Sort of an up and down experience. I got a little bit sick for a while there, but um, it's been great to find get some experience actually. It feels like big finding on faculty is fun. Um, I'm Imogen. I'm doing my undergraduate degree, a uh, Bachelor of Archaeological Practice at ANU. Um, because of COVID, this is both Jessen's and I's first dig ever. So it has been absolutely amazing to come out. Uh, we've found all sorts of amazing things from bones to pottery, um, some charcoal. Mm. It's just, it's an incredible experience to finally be out in the field and working for the first time. Um, and it's all due to everybody here who has been so nice and accommodating and has been helping us get around to our sites um, and preparing us delicious food. And, yeah, yeah in the rain. Exactly, bring our food things in the rain and just, yeah, looking after us. Hi, my name is Lanji. Um, I am a undergrad student at ANU doing a double degree arts law. Um, in my arts degree, I'm doing history and environmental studies. So I find myself out in the Pondola, and doing archaeology as part of that. Um, hi, my name is Rufik. I'm doing a double degree in economics and international security. Um, I don't really have much experience in archaeology, to be honest, but um, the uh, School of History, Culture and Her Heritage run this course as an elective, so I'm taking that, and it's been really great to kind of get my um, hands involved in a different field. Um, I'd say my experience has been, I think, a bit different from what I expected. Um, coming to Tongoa, obviously a very different climate and region to Canberra, uh, back home in Australia, different way of living as well food, culture, it, it's all a bit different, but it's great to see how um, some other people around the world are living. Yeah, and I've um, sort of currently just been working on a little spot um, over there with LinkedIn, and we've just sort of been doing a lot of digging, um, and we found a lot of different artifacts that have come from the missionary who was living here. Like, there's more information about how he built the house and when he built it, like what he sort of did to make sure it was to go off from the elements out here as well. So that was really interesting to see. And yeah, my experience so far has been really awesome. Very um, good to learn. Like, I think I've never been in this part of the world before. So it's been really cool to um, experience that and like, yeah, learn a lot about the culture and what's sort of gone on on this island, particularly in the past. So, yeah. I'm <laughs> 